And two, three, four, no. <laughs> I think that it's working. Yes, people are here. Hey, <laughs> well, while I wait for Olaf, I'm just gonna get very excited about all these people that are joining. Oh, view. Hi, everyone. Wow, Stressica in the house. Hey, Dana. <laughs> How are you? Olaf, hey, I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing Dude, well. Looks like, are you, are, you, are you at home in your kitchen or where yeah, are you? So, you know me, everywhere I go is subway tiles. You know, of course. It's just a roll. But um, I am in the caretaker's cottage here on the property. Which oh, is beautiful. Yeah, it's a little Airbnb cottage that we have at the Oyster Farm. So people can yeah. just stay here and you know, do the thing. You look like you're in a, you're just like Mr. California. I'm Mr. California today. Yes, I'm <laughs> sitting, um, this is the backdrop here is part of our tasting room. Uh, so I figured it was, um, made, made the most sense for me to come to the winery and, and do this in person here. Um, I thought you were going to do it like in your bedroom, Olaf, come on, or like in your bathroom or something. Yeah, uh, no, we have to keep, we have to keep this PG, but um, <laughs> <laughs> happy, happy to participate. Really excited to be able to do, to do this with uh, with you, and uh, obviously with Island Creek. It's been uh, it's been a long time since we were all together, and um, this is this is a great way to reconnect. I think. Yeah, we miss you. We miss you. Likewise, likewise. Well, um, Olaf, we have a lot to talk about, but I've already helped myself to the wine. So okay. Well, so <laughs> what, what 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 do you have? What do you have in your hand? I'm rolling deep already. Um, I yes. have the Estate Chardonnay. All right. And I'm fantastic. It. Well, I think we we should um, obviously want to get into uh, tasting these wines, and more importantly for me, I want to make sure that I can uh, dig into some of these oysters that I've shucked. Looking forward to that. Um, but why don't we, you know, love to hear a little bit about. Um, just this tasting pack that you guys have here for, for the Island Creek and um, everything that you guys have to offer um, from the, the seafood world. And I'm happy to talk just very briefly about our package and, and what we're presenting here today. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to hear all about you too. It's a man the, the behind the myth, you know? Um, yes. So yes. So for anyone that doesn't know, I'm Dana Hale and I work for Island Creek Oysters and I mostly drink wine, but occasionally I sell oysters. Um, I manage all of our consumer facing outlets. So um, basically if anyone is coming to our property or our retail store or our e-com, um, that's under my purview. And let's see. How long, so, have, you, how long have you been at Island Creek? A couple of years? My 10th year. Right on. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. And the industry has changed quite a bit. You know, those were, those were the earlier days of, farm to table and uh, a lot has changed since then. And actually a lot has changed just in the last couple months. So, so speaking that. of the starter pack, um, the reason that we, this is a somewhat controversial package here at Island Creek because we have always sold in hundred counts and 50 counts. So we've always sold, oysters are harvested. As you know, Olaf, you have count wash bag, a number of oysters. Uh, always in bags of 100 oysters. And then maybe, you know, if we're feeling like it, we split the bag and we do 50. Um, and we can be very no nonsense about it. So it's great. You bring them in, you get them in the boxes, you keep them as cold as you can, um, and then you ship them out. But what we found in the last few months is that we've just got so many new followers who um, didn't want 100 oysters sitting in their refrigerator um, because that was that's just a lot of shucking actually um, so we opened up the starter pack to talk to those you know to speak to those people who need like a beginning like a place to to start their journey so that's been something it's totally taken off and uh, it's just reminded us of the beauty and the importance of having like a beginner's mind because we've all been we're all you know salty oyster people and we've been in the seafood industry and it's it's turned us dark and confusing and mean and it's nice to kind of take a step back and remember you know why we started this and and how to bring other people into the fold so yeah i i i love it and 
will definitely be uh, be ordering more start, starter packs myself because, uh, as you said, sometimes it can be hard to take down 100 oysters just with a couple of people. So no matter how good they are. Yes, yes. Yeah. So tell, tell us, speak from your side, Olaf. I want to hear about you. Yeah, happy to. So um, Olaf Gallette here, uh, part of the um, the ownership um, family at Clos de Vol, uh, which was founded uh, back in the early 70s by my grandfather, uh, along with winemaker Bernard Porte. Um, I more recently moved out here um, to join the team here at, at the winery. Um, spent some wonderful years before that at, uh, at Island Creek. Um, and miss those days often. And so that's why this is so fun for me to, to engage with you and uh, the rest of the team there in, in this um, dialogue. Um, but so what we have here to, to pair with, with this starter pack of oysters, we've got three different wines um, in our, um, our wine portfolio. Um, they're all um, small, small lot productions uh, focused for our direct audience. So none of these wines are out in the, in the wholesale market. Um, and that's really something that we, we try and um, really keep segmented um, for our audiences so that we can really, um, one, give our winemaker the, the creativity uh, and the ability to do what he does best, which is curate uh, delicious wines um, and can provide him a canvas where he can be a little bit more, um, uh, I'd say, opportunist opportunistic and creative in terms of what varietals he's going to be playing with and, and what he can offer to our, our loyal customers who, who, who come to our winery and who are willing to engage with us um, directly. So the three wines that we're trying today, which we wanted to make sure that we were pairing things that would go well with oysters. Um, so it's a, it's a Sauvignon Blanc, uh, which comes from our, uh, our Yonville um, vineyard, which uh, it's called State Lane. Uh, so the Yonville AVA is, um, it's kind of in the in the the valley floor in the middle of uh, Napa Valley. Um, I think that this wine goes really well uh, with oysters. Um, it's you know Sauvignon Blanc. There there, there are certain um, styles where you're really trying to push for a more of a, a grassy uh, tone in terms of the aromatics and the flavors, uh, whereas this style is 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 really trying to push more of the uh, the floral and the, and the fruit. Uh, components that can come out of a Sauvignon Blanc grape if you're uh, harvesting it at the right time and the what the right um, winemaking style. So that's the first wine in this series. Um, second wine we have here is a uh, what we're calling a trial series Chardonnay. Um, and I'm just going to bring it up a little bit closer. It's maybe a little tough to see unless um, you're really up close in the camera. This is a, uh, a wine that was its first batch now in 2018. The idea behind it is to uh, is to focus, and Ted really wanted to bring out um, a certain profile of the Chardonnay grape that you don't see very often in California-style Chardonnays. Um, so it was harvested a little bit earlier uh, than we normally would, slightly lower alcohol content uh, because the sugar levels were a little bit lower. Um, we're really trying to hone in on, again, the, um, the floral components that you can get out of a uh, of the Chardonnay fruit um, and not so much the, the butter and oaky uh, flavors and textures that you a lot of times see in a Chardonnay. Uh, so the wine is actually made uh, in more of a Sauvignon Blanc style uh, wine protocol. So cold fermented, uh, fermented in stainless steel tanks. Um, and, um, and also, as, as I said, was um, harvested a little bit earlier. The last wine here, and again, this is also a, a, a first timer for, uh, for Clodoval Winery, is a Riesling. Um, this is the one wine which is not from uh, one of our estate vineyards. Um, and it is really something uh, that uh, our winemaker stumbled upon as an opportunity to, to get a couple tons of Riesling grapes from a, a small uh, vineyard in Petaluma Gap, um, which is a very tight corridor um, that really connects the uh, San Pablo Bay with um, the uh, Pacific Coast. And so it's in Sonoma Valley. Um, and it has really become known for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay varietals. But this particular um, vineyard owner had a really small amount of Riesling. And um, Ted jumped at the opportunity to get a couple tons. And so we made, you know, 100 cases of it. Um, with the hope that our audience would, would enjoy it. So these are the three wines. 
all different, um, but all I think with their own characteristics pair really well with, with oysters. So I'd love to, um, I'm going to pour my glass. It sounds like you've already poured yours. Oh yeah. Um, I actually need to re-pour. So I'm yeah, so if you have to re-pour, please re-pour. Um, um, and I'm going to start with the Sauvignon Blanc and we can just take a quick sip through, I think. Um, and then let's, I'd love to, to, to jump into, um, tasting the oysters and we can talk about, um, the complexity of, of the flavors in the oysters uh, as well. And then maybe we can go back and, and pair them together. Yeah, That's so our, 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 our viewers are pouring wine right now and drinking wine. That's what I'm hoping. So everybody, get your glass, get your wine, get your nose, your mouth. And um, spoiler alert, I've already tried these, Olaf. And I'd love to... I'd love to get your take. And Dana, I think, you know, for, I know this, but I'm sure most of the audience doesn't, you know, I think you, you spent, you lived out here in California for a number of years. So I, you're yeah. well accustomed to, uh, to the wine country out here, both Napa Valley and Sonoma. So I'd love to get your take on these wines. I did. And I, I miss it every day, probably. <laughs> Life just is a little bit better there. That's just, that's just a fact. So it's not so bad here though. But, um, but yeah, I was uh, jobless for three weeks living with a friend at, in Petaluma. So I was sneaking up to wineries all the time and um, just being a kind of a, a rat one, trying everything. So, so I wanted to say that one of the things that got me so stoked and always gets me stoked about wines and oysters is that like on first pass, it's like, yeah, three white wines. Yeah, they have different names. You know, and I, maybe I'm not so accustomed to like what those names exactly mean. Um, even I like just kind of forget. I'm like, I don't know, what's a Sauvignon again? I don't really drink those. And, and, um, and then when you try them, they are insanely different. Like yeah. they offer such different things. And, and that's what happens with an oyster. People say, like, I don't really know how to tell the difference between oysters. And it's like, no, no, no. If you had three oysters that were different varieties, even from this bay next to each other, you would instantly, your tongue would instantly know what was happening and what was different. And yeah. it's fun to try different oysters and different wine, but I think rightly so, we kind of went different on the wine and same with the oyster. And that gives us that sort of a control group so that we can mm -hmm. see how these things like really interact. And one thing I want to start with that I always want to start with in these is that there is no wrong answer. You know, there is no like, oh, you thought those went well together and they don't, you're really stupid. You know, it's, it's totally taste-driven, season-driven, moment-driven, vibe-driven, you know, kind of dynamic interaction with flavors at that moment. And so I think an oyster and, and wine pairing can be traditionally good, but not good at that moment. It can be unusual and you like that. It, it can take on all sorts of different characteristics. So yeah. it's good to give yourself some credibility and give your palate some credibility and just see where it goes rather than feeling like one or the other should be. Yeah. The I think you're, you're touching on a really interesting um, subject here. And one of the things that I, I think is really important to talk about, and it's part of why I thought, and, and we as a group between uh, Clota Vol and Island Creek felt it was, it was fun to get together was to, to, to talk a little bit about and reflect on, um, how important um, the concepts of terroir when it comes to winemaking and, and choices of where to plant vineyards and under what varietals to plant in certain locations. And then, you know, simultaneously this concept of meroir um, for the, you know, if we talk about the, the shellfish industry and, and oysters, but other seafoods as well. Uh, it's something that when I was at Island Creek, I was always uh, really impressed with um, what I thought was the foresight that you and the rest of the team had to really try and leverage what you already know from a, from a farming standpoint, what is so important and what's so critical to have a successful and delicious product, which is the choice of the area in which you decide to grow um, and to farm. And I think when you, when you think about agriculture and aquaculture, the, the, the location, the environment is so critical. Yeah. And, and you for us, we throw oysters in a bay and our, you know, 
thank God our bay is fantastic for oysters, but I don't know if Skip knew that. And maybe the people that planted your vines didn't know that either. But I think the one thing that's cool and I have a question about is, did they know that, oh, this region's rocky, so we'll plant this grape? Or was it sort of like, let's try this grape? Because I feel like people, winemakers can be smart about like this type of grape works in this environment. Yes. Whereas for us, from the Canadian maritime provinces down to Florida, we have the exact same variety. You know, it's the exact same type of oyster, Crustacea virginica. So, uh, so that's like, a, I think a real, a, a little bit of a difference between between the no, two. Ab absolutely. And, um, but even, even just to that point, having one variety um, and then tasting 20 different oysters that come up and down the East Coast, you really recognize how important it, the, the environment reflects within the, the finished product. Um, and to your point, you know, Skip may or may not have um, known the, the full success that Duxbury Bay could offer in terms of a, a, a oyster growing region. Uh, but I think what he did recognize were the fundamental characters that allowed for a good environment to, yeah. to raise oysters, which is things like mm -hmm. access to um, fresh water as well as the seawater, sea uh, strong, strong currents and, and water flow, uh, great nutrient rich environments. Um, and so although he hadn't, didn't have something proven out to, to spell it, he knew directionally that there was an opportunity there. Yeah, and a lot uh, of Babes. A lot of hot babes coming out of this town too, which is a very Absolutely. thing for oysters. <laughs> no, so it's interesting in terms of talking on, on, the, on the, the, the vineyard side. Um, and I wanted to just very briefly again, touch on this first wine that we're tasting and we, we got to get into the other ones, but just an interesting highlight about this Sauvignon Blanc, which is um, the, the vineyard where these grapes are grown from um, which is in uh, the Yonville AVA. The vineyard was purchased um, by the winery for the purpose of uh, growing Cabernet Sauvignon grapes. Mm. Um, and the property in total is about 18 acres um, and it sits adjacent to the Napa River. And so the, the, the edge of the property is very close to the river. And when you look at the soil composition that um, sits on that 18 acres, as you get closer to the river, the soil becomes much richer and denser um, and is really poor soil conditions for um, something like a Cabernet Sauvignon varietal. And the, the winemaker at the time, uh, Bernard Porte and, and his vineyard manager decided that rather than planting Cabernet Sauvignon grapes, let's plant something else that actually can do well in this kind of soil environment. Uh, and their choice was Sauvignon Blanc. And I think they proved that out well, that they really understood what made for a good environment from a soil composition standpoint for a specific varietal. Mm -hmm. And even if it's in the same location, just the understanding that the, the differences in the soil, um, even if it's just an acre apart, could have such a big impact in terms of what, what, what should be grown there. Right. Um, and so, it's, it's a nice, it's a nice take that myself, as I was doing some research on this, cause I, you know, I'm still learning about this industry and, and the complexities from the vineyard management side. That was something that jumped out to me that I just thought was fascinating. And as we talk about terroir and marijuana, I thought that that was a, a key um, example of how, how important it can be to, to pick the right environment for the right thing. Well, it's, it's, it tastes pretty right to me. Someone's asking what the name of the Sauvignon Blanc is. So it's Estate Sauvignon Blanc from Yonville. Yonville, Napa Valley. Napa so Valley. Um, the estate is really just to, to uh, reflect the fact that it's from our own, um, our own vineyards or our estate vineyards. Uh, and it's something that Clodeval has really focused on in, in the more recent years to really have an estate focused program, uh, really relying on being able to control the sourcing of our grapes, the way that our vineyards are, are farmed and managed. Um, so that we, you know, and you can talk, you, you can talk about this on, on the, on your side with oysters, being able to control as much as possible all the way through before it gets to your customer, uh, is really important. And you, that goes everywhere from your own product to, as you guys, you know, sourcing products, making sure that you're sourcing it from the people that, 
you know, practice and do, do all the things that you guys want to stand behind. Yeah, um, I think we source, I was just looking at a list. I think we source about between 40 and 50 other oyster varietals right now, in wow. addition to our own. And are those, are those all available in starter packs? <laughs> no, because my operation team would absolutely kill me if that was the case. So, but yeah, there, we, we never used to have, it, our website was always, you know, it was always Island Creeks only because it was better than that. But I think yeah. over the years, I mean, you saw sort of one stage of it and that's only continued. We realized there's a lot of amazing oysters and there's a lot of different reasons why they're amazing. And I'm sure it's not that different in you sourcing grapes from someone you're friendly with, but it's just recognizing that like, uh, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of diversity that we want to represent in the, in the oyster world. And we like to call ourselves the Napa Valley of oysters over here in Cape Cod. And so I believe, I believe <laughs> so, uh, maybe with a little less drunk driving, I'm just gonna, or maybe not. I don't know. Actually, <laughs> if you, you've ever been here, you might also question that. Um, so, so are people, are people drinking now? Because they should be. So well, drinking, I, I hope, I hope they have some oysters, um, shucked or in the process of being shucked, shucked so they can, uh, participate in this, uh, combining of, of the two flavors. And so yeah. to that point, Dan, I think we gotta, we gotta jump to our next wine so we can get into eating okay, oysters, so, which is what I'm most interested in doing right now. So, so. right now we're, we're just, we sip the Sauvignon. Yeah. We so let's just hold our cards like close to our chest for now and then try a new, oh, we are drinking. That's right, wine, Doug. I love good, that. Here's good. to you. Okay. So Te I think if, if, if we want to quickly touch on the Chardonnay, uh, this trial series, um, this is from our, uh, our vineyard located in Carneros. Um, it's again, something that's been in, in um, Clodeval's portfolio really since its inception. I think it was purchased in 1974 um, and its first plantings in 1980. Um, again, just a couple quick notes on this. What, what makes the, for those who don't know, and I'm sure there's a lot of people who do listening to us, Carneros um, Appalachian is well known for uh, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay production. Um, it's, our, it's, it's, it's much further south in, in Napa Valley, so it's really pushing towards San Pablo Bay. And our property itself is really on the, towards the southern portion of uh, Carnero. So we are, as the crow flies, you know, about five miles from San Pablo Bay. So we get a very nice cooling um, sea breeze influence. Um, and you get a lot of fog, especially in the summertime here, which allows um, for a really good climate and environment for a varietal like Chardonnay. Um, and so that property has primarily been a, a Chardonnay and Pinot um, vineyard. Uh, this wine style is slightly different, as I said, so there's no oak influence, no, no malactic fermentation. Um, so it's really not what you would generally expect from a California Chardonnay, but that's kind of what we love about it and really showing what, what you can do with, with the varietal. Sorry, I had to sneak one. Wine, Doug, you can eat an oyster whenever you want to eat an oyster, okay? You can go for it, but we're going to talk about them. <laughs> we're going to talk about them. We're going to drink the wines first, but I'm going to have to cheat on a few oysters. Um, these two wines are so different. The first one for me was like, just like soft and like fruity, but more like a, like a over, like a pear, like a, like a, not a pow fruit. Like a, it was just soft and round and with some, some like melony perry fruitiness and then the chardonnay is like whew, like tart or sour even or lemony or like some oh. I'm not very good at describing wine because i describe it like oysters but this is like high notes for me not like dampened soft view and it's um i can imagine the yeah i'm very curious because i can imagine the sob kind of working with the oyster because of its like roundness but then the shard comes in and it's like cuts right through sort of the saltiness but it there's something about the chardonnay i think because because it's so that like tartness is so unexpected for me because often a california chardonnay is like that is 
pulled away by that like malolactic thing. Yeah. So, um, and it doesn't have any like gooiness on the back end for none of that like. It's, it's very, it's very, I, I think very clean. Yeah, in terms yeah. Of, um, it's coating my tongue. It's almost all in like the roof. Yeah. It's delish. I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad to yeah. hear it. I hope I hope Ted Henry's on uh, our winemaker because uh, I know that this is this was mm -hmm. something that he was eager to to try out, and it's it's fun to see how you can take a specific wine wine style in terms of a protocol for making it uh, and just make it with a different varietal. Uh, so I think the, the way that he made this this Chardonnay was really following a very similar protocol to what he used for the Sauvignon Blanc in mm -hmm. terms of cold fermentation all the way through, um, not touching um, oak barrels, and really giving it that clean environment uh, and really trying to extract a different uh, component of that, of that grape than mm -hmm. what, is, what our traditional Chardonnay is, which is a little bit more texture driven, um, a little more buttery and um, obviously oak influenced. Mm. Yeah. Um, it's like all that Chardonnay is like hits the front of my tongue. It's like a salt in that way. Like it, it's like pow. Whereas I just had some more of that, and that's perfuming my mouth, but really not have, doesn't have any placement in my mouth. Yeah. It's sort of like everywhere. So should we should we quickly jump to the Riesling? So I'm I'm just I'm <laughs> eager because I want to I want to jump into the uh, into the oysters, and I'm trying yeah. not to cheat. So yeah. Oh. Um, you're so yeah, so this Riesling, as I had said, I'm just gonna bring it up again, Dana, so you can see it. I know you've got it in front of you, but um, just so that the audience knows we're moving on to the Riesling. Uh, again, as I said, this is, this is the one wine that's not um, from our state vineyards, um, which is not, it's, so it's, it's not traditional to our, our, our model today, which is really a state focused. Um, but again, when, you've, when you have a creative winemaker, um, you wanna give him an opportunity uh, even if it's just for a small, small lot production like this. So when you t you're talking 100 cases, um, as long as, you know, the wine is great and we can, we can explain the story to our, our customers and our audience, not worried about the 100 cases um, disappearing. Um, and the Riesling is, is fun because um, it's not a, a super popular uh, varietal here in, in California. Um, obviously, you know, Germany and, and parts of, of Europe are really known for, uh, for, the, for, for Riesling wines. But it's interesting, the Petaluma Gap and the, um, the climate that the Petaluma Gap offers, as I'd said, it's, you know, it's, it's this very tight corridor that, that uh, sort of bridges uh, San Pablo Bay over to uh, the Pacific Ocean. Um, and it's a bit of a mountainous little area. So it gets intense winds and really strong um, coastal influence. So really, if the, if the wind is blowing the right way on this property, you get, you get that nice, salty, fresh, fresh air smell that you get sitting in Duxbury Bay, for example. Um, and, um, but it stays really cool, really cool. And um, that's important for the, for the Riesling um, grape varietal. So excited about it because it's new for us. Um, it's a dry Riesling. Um, and really the main understanding on dry Riesling is that um, as long as the, um, the ratio of acid to sugar is uh, one to one and not um, lower, um, it can be considered a, a dry Riesling. So for this w uh, wine, I believe the, uh, for, for one liter of wine, there's six grams of sugar and there's eight grams of acid. So the acid helps to overpower that really sweet flavor. Um, and then can you allow you to have that designation of a dry Riesling? This one has a, it, this one has a very different aftertaste for me, a very different finish. Mm. Because it's not fruit, not sour. It's not tart. It's not. What is it? What is that? It's like not it's a earth, good question. but it's like never... earthy, but it's something that's not those, you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like its own thing. 
Like it yeah. has its own. I did not know of this dry definition. Yeah, I didn't know about it either. And I still think this wine, though, would you still say this wine is sweeter than the other ones? Yeah, I would say it is. is. I would say yeah, it is. So I think you, you'll find certain Rieslings where um, the acid levels are much higher. So it's even more, um, it overshadows the, the sweetness that comes out of that uh, Riesling grape. You know, I was talking to to uh, to Ted, our winemaker, yesterday, uh, just to make sure that what I was saying was in some ways baked in in kind of real real context. Um, and he was explaining to me that the Riesling grape, um, when it comes to ripening and harvesting, is very finicky, and it takes a while to really show its flavor characteristics within the grape. So when you're out there, you're one thing that you're trying to track is, is the sugar levels. So the bricks in the, in the, in the grape, which helps identify the right moment to, to harvest it. But at the same time, you're looking for certain flavors that you get out of the grape. And for certain varietals, they start showing flavor components quite early on. Mm. Um, whereas the Riesling, it takes a while before it yeah. really starts showing its characteristics and then it really takes off fast. So if you pick it too late, it's going to be right. overly sweet. Right. and overly um, like maybe. Uh, sort of sweet driven. And if you do it too early, it's going to be way too acidic. Uh, and so there is that sweet spot if you're really trying to achieve uh, a, a balance. This mine's getting warm now. Yeah. I it in ice. And that's always, I always find like that's interesting with wine okay. and oysters. I love them cold. Like I love white wine cold. It's 80 degrees out today. I love oysters cold, but there is, I have to say, when things start warming up a little, you do get like a little more of the fuller picture of what's happening. And all of a sudden, like the, this wine has changed a little bit for me in, yeah. you know, since I tried it when it was like. I think it's, that, cool. that, that goes the same for, uh, for oysters, I'd say, you know, if, if your oysters are too cold, you lose a bit of the, of the flavor as well. If they've been sitting on ice for too long. Can we, can we, can we jump into the oysters? <laughs> yeah, I've already done it. So yeah, okay. everybody, let's, um, let's, Why? I mean, let's fry them together, but let's just throw a few down just okay. because that's what we do. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Man. You know, it always makes me laugh. Island Creek oysters because when you try your first couple and it's like, damn that's an oyster like <laughs> that is not a shy that's a lot of flavor in that oyster you know and I think it's important one of the things Olaf and I talked about before we spoke is that we both really wanted to drink a lot of wine and try a lot of oysters because mm -hmm. some of the tastings that we've done the Meroir terroirs are sort of like have a sip of wine have an oyster okay let's move on but it's an iterative process where you kind of have to like you have an experience and then you go back and you can kind of like work your way into how you feel about it. And I would say with oysters, like you try the first one or two and it's like immediately your palate's like, boom, salt. Like you're reading salt like crazy. And then once you uh, acclimate a little bit to the salt, then you start to get a little bit more accustomed to it and start the other flavors start to be revealed. Yeah. And so I think that's why we're kind of like, we want to taste the wines. We want to have, throw back a few oysters and just have the experience. Then we can start, then we can do them side by side. But already I can tell you, I have, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts already on it. So I, talking what do you about think? Are they still good? Pull up? Yeah, they're, they're, they're amazing. They're oh delicious. my God, that one just tasted like a Pringle. Honestly, that just tasted like a Pringle out of the box. Out of the box. Um, you have one type of oyster, just one, Island Creeks. Um, and like we said, part of the reason that we did that is because we need a constant. But what's hilarious about that is that oysters, like they, they make a fool out of you every time you want to talk about them because they are so responsive to the time and what you've eaten and what your mood is. And so like we will probably all have a little bit of a different experience, but um, I would say, I, well, I don't want to. I don't want to tell everyone what they should think about the oysters. I'm. I'm actually just curious, what you're tasting, Olaf, and what what 
everyone else is tasting. What do you guys think? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to let some people uh, chime in here with notes if they want, but I'll, I'll take um, at least my stab at it. Um, mm -hmm. One thing that I I've always liked about Island Creek's oysters and in general, some of the oysters that come out of Duxbury Bay is that it has a very complex flavor pro profile. Um, to, to your point, Dana, it, when you take when you take one of these oysters down, the first thing that hits your your palate is that saltiness, and you you get that feeling that you're you're tasting something that's coming right out of the ocean. But the taste doesn't disappear, and it just evolves, and it becomes more complex after you've swallowed it, and as as the the flavors linger on your tongue. Um, I know talking to to our winemaker, that's something that he always searches for in his winemaking style is you don't want a wine that just comes at you right off the gate and then disappears, right? You want to have good balance and structure so that it, it's hitting all of your, uh, your, sense, your senses on your tongue. And I think that's what makes Island Creek Oysters so unique is that it does that. It, 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 it accomplishes that, um, that balance and complexity on, in the flavor profiles. I mean, how many, did you just eat a couple, Olaf? Uh, yeah, I've had four. So yeah, that, that is like everywhere for me right now. Yeah, and it doesn't it doesn't go away. It just doesn't no. go away. God, it's um, so because I've been doing this for so long, but every time I'm like, "Oh, can you do this thing?" It's like, "Oh, somebody got a pearl!" Yeah, brother. <laughs> um, every time I try them, I'm like, "Oh man, these are good. Yeah, these are awesome." <laughs> so Dana, I'd love to. Um, if I can put you on the spot here, do you mind taking, um, picking your wine, picking a wine that you think um, you would choose to pair with an oyster and, and, and do the taste and everyone can follow and uh, we can go through that taste together. Okay, so I need to. Make need sure you to, got the right glass, right? I need to prepare for this. Um, so yeah, so we three. Let me see, let me, let me just mess around for a second. So, mm. all right. So one of the things we talk about with Island Creeks is like, I just ate that oyster and it is, um, it is not just, we, we distinguish between salt and brine. So salt being the, the, the taste of actual salt, take some salt, stick it on your tongue. That's what we're talking about. Like, Try things like a Wellfleet or a Chatham. Like you, you're like, I don't know what that means. And so you try it and you're like, oh, that tastes like salt. So that is distinguished in our minds from brine, which is the sort of mushroomy, like umami-ish version of salt in which you have salt, but it's sort of like salt plus plus, like salt plus algae plus dirt plus mushroom plus chicken you know it's just got like a lot more to it and i feel like that last island creek that i had just like brought that everywhere into my mouth the the sort of like fullness of that food flavor actually not just ocean right. you know does that make sense olaf or am i just no, no it, does. it does okay it does all right so the question is what wine do I think kind of like works with that? Mm. I, <laughs> I do enjoy them all. I'm probably the wrong person to ask, <laughs> but I will. There's no wrong answer, Dana. As you said, there's no wrong answer. So I know just I just that I'm secretly judging you all, frankly. Um, I, I think, okay, it's very, a, a more straightforward pairing to me is the shard because of that like high, citrusy thing but it's not so it's not only that it's high in citrusy but then it's also got big it's two kind of big flavor items but I feel like it it kind of like cuts through the oyster in a way that I really like so you know with pairing you can kind of do like and like or dislike and dislike or you know they can pair in a lot mm. of different manners and uh, they're all sort of legitimate, but let me just try the Riesling. I, I think uh, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna try this as just as a combo. So you take the oyster, and then I'm gonna get a nice sip of that Chardonnay. Oh, 
So all that, all that, all that fat and that roundness on your tongue, and then you take the shard and it's like hyper clean, like upper citrusy thing that kind of like washes over it, but doesn't disappear because I just had a sip of the Chardonnay. That oyster is still there. And I think yeah. that's one of the things, like one of the reasons we don't drink like a giant cab with our oysters is because we don't want to destroy the taste. You know, you, you kind of don't want to like crush the taste of either, you know? Yeah. Did you like that? Yeah, that was really nice. Yeah. That was it's, really hard nice. To, it's hard because I think that I, I'm, I'm getting a little tender with the Chardonnay only because I, I, love, I love when something, um, when I expect something and I get something different, you know? So I feel like, oh, California Chard, goodbye, not interested, you know? So I think that especially, you know, I think that it's sort of like, uh, it surprises me, you know? Yeah, you like just being like, surprised. Just like you, like you Olaf. You, you like being surprised. You, you delight and surprise me, always. So, the, um, I'm gonna take this one actually from, um, from Ted, our winemaker, because I was um, asking him some of, the, some of the food pairings that he generally goes towards um, on some wines, and this was something that I'd never thought about. Um, he said that, Rieslings and especially dry Rieslings can compare really well with spicy foods. Mm. Um, and so I was thinking about that. This is not, not a way that I generally eat my oysters, but for those out there who do like a little Tabasco um, oh. or a little hot sauce on their oyster, oh, yeah. um, the Riesling might be, the, might be the right pairing for you mm. um, as it I helps tone that. down a little bit the spice, the spice component. I love that. I just got, um, this is, Maybe I'm not supposed to plug someone else. But I'm going to plug someone else. I just got this hot sauce from Rancho Gordo. You know them, Olaf? Uh, never heard of them. They, um, they're a California company. They, they sell dry beans and really oh. tasty dry beans. But they make a lot of different hot sauces. And, I, I, you know, uh, they make, a, hot, they make a, a mild sauce for hot people. I thought that was really my sauce. So I bought that. But it's um, that, that sauce because it doesn't just like burn your face off. It's got like a lot of power, but it's sort of mellow. And then that sauce, and then obviously the green Tabasco, which yeah. is like a classic. Um, I, I feel like both of those are personally ones that I love on oysters. It's like, it's cool, you know, fly, fly your freak flag. You know, if you wanna throw cocktail sauce, we're like not huge fans of, but Go you know. For it. What'd you say? Yeah, go for it, right? As you yeah. said, there's no, there's no wrong way to enjoy uh, no. these oysters or these wines. No. Um, but but man, what do you like best? Tell me what you, tell me what pairing you like best and why. So I actually just went um, without any hot sauce. I went and took a, um, an oyster and then took a sip of that Riesling. And I'm going to yeah. do it again because uh, I thought it was actually quite nice mm -hmm. um, as a combo. Let me mm. um, And what I get out of out of the the flavor yeah. here is totally. Um, in some ways, the oyster helps um, quiet down some of the some of the sweetness. Although it's not a very sweet wine, there yeah. is a, there's a slight sweetness to it and i think the oyster tones that down a little bit yeah um so i thought that was actually really really smooth i have to say also that i think that like what was cool i just did that what was cool about that is i had i had sometimes i think the flavors can sort of mix and create something new and sometimes they can stay their own flavors and i just had those two and i was like oyster riesling oyster like they didn't really squash each other they right. existed peacefully in yeah. a fun way yeah i agree i agree i love all these wines so i'm not a great judge well so you're gonna have to answer so you, you picked the wine that you thought went best with the oysters but you have to tell me which wine you like the most because uh, i've i've committed to sending you a case of whichever, <laughs> wine, whichever wine you like the most so uh, uh you're gonna have to let me know you can you can say it online now or you can tell me later mm. 
any excuse I have to continue our conversation offline, Olaf, I will take. So don't put that past me. I, um, so now we're neglecting the Sauvignon. So now we have to try an oyster and, with the Sauvignon and see well, what so that's I, I still haven't seen. I want somebody who writes these wonderful things. I want to hear what you like the best and, or, or what your thoughts are. So please tell me. Um, yeah. And in terms of the Sauvignon Blanc, it's been far from neglected here on my table because it's the only wine that is empty. So I had to refill it. Um, but I have not tried it directly with one of these oysters. So I look forward to that. So this, I think, is a, well, I don't want to color your thoughts. This is less straightforward, this combination. And I think one of the fun things, guys, is that when we sit around and try oysters, it's like a, it, I think it actually builds synapses in your brain. <laughs> Sauv Blanc is the best. Nice. We got a fan. Um, I think that it builds synapses because you have these experiences and then you try to give words to, you try to apply words to feeling and taste. And sometimes that's like, someone's like Parmesan, Gorgonzola, you know, Emmentaler. And you're like, ah, I got it. Um, and sometimes it's, is a little more elusive. And personally, like sometimes I can have an epiphany, but with that, I was just like, whoa, a lot going on, man. Like I can't pin that down right now. Yeah, I, I struggle at times to really articulate what I'm what I'm tasting, um, but I, I I do agree with you. It it is very much subjective, and really in that moment, you know, you can try you could try the same combination tomorrow, uh, and you'll get a totally different um, experience. Mm. I would say like I think they exist as like they're like. To me, they're like cousins. They love each other, but they don't hang out that often. And they don't like get in fights like siblings because they don't like play with the same toys every day. But they're like oh. totally fine. But whereas I thought the the drizzling and the oysters, like uh, they, they, they played together and they both kind of held their own. The shard and the oysters, I felt like interacted in an interesting way. These, I feel like they, they both have a flavor, but I guess when I tried the sauve and then I had the oyster, the sauve flavor went away and now I have the oyster flavor and now I'm coming back to the sauve and I, I don't think they're anti, but I don't personally, I don't feel like there's like, I just don't know what to say about it really. It's like yeah. there's so much flavor. I don't know, I don't know kind of a mystery it's a great wine though and the great oyster. <laughs> great oyster. that's tough let me see mm. i'd love to see if there's any more uh any more feedback from from our audience as to you know i i know some someone said that they felt the sauvignon blanc was best and i'd love to hear their take as to what what makes it the best one of the three with the with the oysters What's interesting, one thing I think is interesting is when you, you drink the wine and you have the oyster, now it's just oyster. Whereas when I had the Riesling, I drank the wine, I ate the oyster, I didn't lose the wine as much. I don't think that's a bad thing at all. I just think it's like, and I think the Sauvignon Blanc is very, it just has its own attitude. So the question is like, By now, I've drank half the bottle of Sauvignon, so it's actually really working for me. We, 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 should, be tape, we should be tapering everything that you say, is what you're saying. Uh, I, it's, it's, these wines are incredibly different. How many so, wines yeah. do you guys make, Olaf? Do you guys make like a billion? By the way, I wanted to say, this is in, for real. You don't know, Carneros is in my blood. I love that place. Like I really? love, first of all, I had no idea it was near the water because I always went to Carneros from Petaluma. Yeah. You don't see any water there, but 
it is such a like majestic I always felt like really intimidated by Napa and um just like this whole show of of what was happening there and the knowledge and but Carneros felt like maybe it's different now because that was a while ago but Carneros always felt like a little quiet place that was like my own little place it was it was interesting I was I was talking with um Shannon um our marketing director um earlier and she we were talking about the Carneros AVA and how if you look at the plots or the the parcels of land in, in Carneros a lot of them are quite big uh mm -hmm. whereas if you go further north in Napa Valley a lot of them are much smaller so you can you can have parcels that are five acres or even slightly smaller but and then bigger whereas Carneros they're much bigger pieces and I think it if you look historically, Carneros was very much um, more of a, um, a grazing uh, and a lot of cattle and sheep farming. And um, so to that point, I think it is, it definitely is slightly behind um, or was behind in terms of really jumping into the, uh, the wine industry. And, and when Bernard Porte, our founding winemaker, when he picked Carneros, um, as, as a location where he wanted to make Bur Burgundian varietals, so Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, um, Carneros was predominantly still uh, cattle farms and sheep farms. Oh my God. Um, what year was that? Olaf? That was that was in 1990, uh, sorry, 1974, I believe. Just 73 stop. or 74. Stop. If it's the 70s and you're in Carneros, like you're doing something right and you're deciding to grow wine, like it, that's amazing. That must have been so, it must have been so beautiful at that time. Still beautiful, it's still beautiful. It but is. Different, but different. Yeah. Um, back to your question, because I, I did want to answer the question. You know, we, we make a number of, of, of different wines um, in our, uh, what I would call our, our distributed wines. So in the wholesale market, um, we really focus on, on five, um, five wines today. It's, um, a Chardonnay, a Pinot Noir, a Merlot, a Cabernet Sauvignon, and then a Reserve Cabernet, hmm. uh, which is a 100% Cabernet. Um, and then on on our direct side, we have an additional um, 12 wines, 12 to 13, it depends, it really flexes. So in a year like when we're making the, the Riesling, we, we really allocate a slot for a sort of a, what I would call a fun wine, which mm -hmm. is very small production is something unique and different. In 2018, it actually was this uh, trial series Chardonnay. Um, but I think we've all loved it so much that we decided to make it again in 2019. Mm. Um, the, the portfolio is very focused, uh, predominantly focused on Cabernet Sauvignon and Bordeaux varietals. Uh, but Claude Duval has a rich history in, in uh, Chardonnay as well. Um, speaking back to uh, our our Carneros Vineyard. And so, um, although it historically and where our home is, is in Stag's Leap, which is uh, known for uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, we, and that is our focus, we definitely do um, participate in other, other varietals as well. So it's mm. a little bit off, sort of a little bit of everything, but with a very strong focus to uh, the Bordeaux varietal uh, group. Oh, Bordeaux is such a garbage heap. I don't know why you would do that. <laughs> Olaf I don't know about French, that. I don't know. Olaf is a French speaker, everyone. Okay, and also he speaks a lot of Nordic languages. He's a, he's an impressive, impressive figure. How's how's your Spanish these days? <laughs> my Spanish is uh, limited to my interaction with my one and three year old in Spanish words. So no, my Spanish. Uh, honestly, my Spanish really needs to improve because it's it's okay, and I'm I'm I really want it to be awesome, you know. So, uh, Dana, for for the audience that is um, less accustomed to Island Creek, and um, you know what, obviously there's there's a great opportunity to engage with you guys all um, um, through through the e-commerce space, and I think you guys have really proven out how successful an e-commerce platform can be for, um, for agricultural or aquaculture um, businesses. Um, but I do know 
just from my own experience that you guys are also very heavily focused um, in the on-premise world. And it'd be great for people to kind of get an under, just an understanding of what you guys do and, and how we can get, get access to your, to your great oysters. And also, you know, I know you guys offer so much more than just your own oysters. So I'd love yeah. to just hear a couple snippets on that. Yeah, well, you know, it's even hard for us to know what we do and we work here. So I'm not sure I can explain that. No, I'm just kidding. But it is, we do so many different things that uh, sometimes people will be like, I'm a little confused. And it's like, you know, you're not the only one. Uh, because we're just kind of exuberant. And so we move in a lot of different directions quickly. Um, we obviously, so we have a, a, a nine acre or maybe it's 11 acre. It's a lot of acreage on the, um, on the water here in Duxbury, Massachusetts. I think it's 11. I, I remember it being 11. <laughs> it's a lot uh, for Duxbury only because Duxbury is, is, you know, it's basically like, you know, we walked into a Polo Ralph Lauren catalog when you come to Duxbury. I grew up here, so I know all about that. Um, and so we have this uh, property here and we have uh, a, a raw bar where we serve oysters right at the farm and tin fish and caviar. That's been a new thing that we've started working with. So we have that here. We have um, a place in Portland uh, where we sell a lot our own varietals, but also a lot of Maine varietals specifically. Um, and that place is just awesome. Um, and then we have obviously a retail store here, and then we have um, our e-commerce site. We work with a lot of chefs. Um, and then we have an e-commerce platform where we sell our oysters and a whole bunch of other people's oysters, clams, caviar. And um, Olaf and I were talking a little bit uh, before this. Um, I was just kind of candidly asking him, you know, like, how has the quarantine affected you guys? Like, how's that been for you? Because it's been a crazy, crazy moment um, for all of us. And I will say for, for Island Creek, one of the things that it's done is we went from working with, my battery's pretty low, yeah. Um, we went from working with 600 chefs roughly a week to zero within a week, literally zero. Um, and so that was, yeah, it was, it was devastating. And then, um, our e-commerce business on the other hand, which was a, a fledgling, you know, a small part of our business went from, you know, we sold 50 bags on mother's day last year. We sold 800 bags, you know, it was just a zillion percentage growth. And so that came with a whole bunch of other issues and, and a lot of excitement on our end. Um, but I think that, uh, that we have, we're so lucky because we were already really interested in, we were already really interested in e-commerce as a platform and have, and have already really developed it. And so, so I think that it's, it's kind of amazing that you can be in California or Minnesota or Kansas and you can order by 3 PM and they can literally be on your doorstep by 10 30 the next morning. Like I think seafood really benefits from yeah from e-commerce. And what was interesting, Olaf, is that we were talking about how, in your case, it's just not quite as clear as that. The direct relationship that we have coveted and worked on so hard is, is just not as easy. Yeah, I, you know, on our end, our, our engagement um, with, with our customers directly has been so heavily uh, supported through our tasting room. Um, and then obviously having wine club members who are, you know, really valuable uh, supporters of our brand. Um, that's really been at the core of our, um, of that portion of our business. And when the tasting room is forced to close down and that traffic goes down to zero, um, it, it forces you to think. And it's something that uh, our team here has been deep in thought about over the last, I'd say probably the last year plus uh, but this um, this pandemic has forced us to accelerate hard fought action, and um, really excited to see the initial feedback we've gotten from uh, our existing uh, audience as well as new audiences in terms of rolling out things like virtual wine tastings, uh, where we can cater a, a great wine experience to you at your house. 
Yeah. Um, and, and then just, just finding ways to engage.